All right, good afternoon. Excellent. I uh, hope everybody's had a great day. It's so great that you guys get together like this. It's really, really impressive. So uh, I'm going to try to you know, tell some stories, entertain a little bit. Uh, we'll have some fun. We're going to talk about the journey we've been on at the Weather Company for really the last four years, transforming ourselves from the Weather Channel, basically a TV media business, into the Weather Company, which is uh, you know, a big data technology software uh, business that was bought by IBM earlier this year. So we're going to go through that, and then we'll, uh, hopefully we'll have some time for some Q&A. So uh, we'll get around, and hopefully we'll ask some fun questions, and uh, we'll make it interactive. So with that, we'll try to wake everyone up. All right, that gives you a little bit of a background around who we are, because a lot of times it's kind of complicated around who's the weather company. Um, some people know us for our mobile applications, some people know us for weather.com, um, but we do a lot. And so that Carmen line, which is 62 miles up, is really, that's all we've got, 62 miles between here and outer space, which really is what allows life to be possible here on Earth. Um, so our job is to map the atmosphere. Google maps the streets. Um, they take care of the roads for us and give us maps, and we try to map the atmosphere. Uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, think about if all the roads were repaved and, and redone constantly. Uh, mapping the atmosphere is, is a lot of fun. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about my favorite airplane, the SR-71. Um, and uh, even though it really hasn't flown for 15 years, it still holds uh, the official record for the fastest manned jet-powered aircraft. Um, and I'll talk about why I think that's relevant to everyone that's in the IT industry and why I think that aircraft kind of symbolizes what we all have to go through on a continual basis um, as IT professionals. It's not all happy days in IT. Um, this, was the organ this was the architecture um, of the weather company in 2012. Um, we had 13 data centers at the time. They were uh, not there for redundancy. They were actually all interconnected and spliced together and we were mounting you know, uh, you know, drives uh, over the WAN, and um, I mean, it was a mess. Um, and so when we set forth to change the business, and we said, wow, we really need to turn ourselves into a big data technology company because the intersection of weather and your own life is tremendous. I mean, if you just think about how many decisions you make differently on a monthly basis, on a daily basis, because of the weather, it trickles down. And weather impacts about a third of the world's GDP every day. And we wanted to set forth to go figure out how could we help businesses and people make smarter decisions by having a better understanding of their own business, their own life, the world around them, historic, current, and forecasted weather conditions. We had all these grand plans. And then I looked at this when I joined, and I said, well, not really sure how we're going to do that. 
um, we're probably going to have to rethink uh, the technology and our approach as a team. Um, nobody did anything wrong building this, right? This was a collection of capabilities that was built over many years. It was acquisitions. Things occurred. Um, businesses changed. We didn't always get the investment that we needed every year, so we kind of would string stuff along another year and another year and another year. But when I joined in 2012, you know, the team was, was proud of this, as they should have been, because everybody was keeping it going. But there was really no way um, that that was going to work. And so I really had to have a debate with myself. And there's really, I think, two personas that we kind of face in the world of IT. There's the CTO and the CIO. Um, and I do think they're different. And you know, if you think about most large organizations, there are these two competing dynamics that are occurring in any IT organization. You have the one side that needs reliability and predictability. And they need to have things that just work, and I need to be able to know what it is, and I would rather just have it shrink-wrapped, and I would rather not have to deal with it, and I would like guarantees and outcomes, please. And that's usually what my CIO had is tugging me towards. And then on the other side, I've got you know, my dev shop who wants flexibility, and they want scalability, and they want agility. They want to break some glass. They're OK with higher levels of risks. And that's where I, my CTO hat comes in. And I have to kind of debate with myself. And so um, you know, I think in a lot of places, you end up with different organizations debating. Um, David Kinney, who, who Ann talked about, who was the CEO of the weather company at the time and hired me, said, you know, well, let's just put all those debates, and you can debate with yourself and have fun with that. Um, but for, for us to change the business, I really had to fall more on the CTO side of the scale. We had to really become a lot more willing to take risks as an organization. We had to be willing to, to, to go outside of our comfort zone um, and go and create. And, and that was the journey that we set forth. And that really fundamentally became a cultural conversation. It wasn't a technical conversation. It very quickly became a cultural conversation. And it was around how do we change the culture of the team? Because the technology, we can go figure that out. We can hire smart people, we have smart people, we can retrain people. There's all sorts of ways to solve the technical problem. But it really became a cultural problem because the culture of our organization at the time didn't really respect or understand why we would want to go do these things, what's wrong with what we're doing. Um, and so we had to spend a lot of time resetting the culture, becoming more willing to take risks as a team Becoming more willing to throw away the old, to not completely fantasize over the old. We spent a lot of time admiring how great it was when we stood up this rack, cabled this environment. We spent a lot, we take pictures of it, and we are proud of it. As IT professionals, we should be proud of it, right? Um, I think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But you can't let that get in the way of the future. And, and, and helping a team go through the journey of cultural change and then feel good about what they're doing was really what I, you know, became job number one for me. Um, and so day one, being at the company, knowing that we were going to go on this journey well before I started, was around moving all of our on-prem stuff off, killing it, and moving to the cloud for the tools that we give people. So the first thing we had to do was say, look, you know, all of our tools that we give people, like, reflect the culture that we want to have. The environment that we operate in, the environment, whether you're an IT professional or you work in finance or you work in marketing or you're in, on one of the brand teams, no matter what group you are within the organization, the tools that we're giving you kind of are the way we want you to work. And so if we're giving you this locked down, rigid environment, you know, for us, we only allowed you to have a Windows PC, you had to run a VPN token for, to, to, to do anything. Um, it, nothing really was easy. And so how do we take the shackles off of our teams and allow them to, to operate more freely? So, so job number one was, was, was starting with you know, the tools, because I felt like if we, if we really got to the, the tools, that we would then help free up the thinking around culture. And that conversation around the tools was really around the commoditization that was occurring. Email was a commodity. Even you know, video chat was a commodity. All of the tools that we were using had been commoditized over time. 
And so for us to spend time figuring out how we continue to run all of this stuff, just not something we needed to do. Now, I think this journey from an IT perspective is really important for all of us to never forget. What we're all doing today is being commoditized as we sit here. And, and we have to be comfortable with that. And I think it's okay. And I think we all have to kind of realize that that's exciting. And, and that's, what's gonna, that's what makes our jobs fun. It's also what makes our jobs frustrating. It's also what makes our jobs complicated. But this commoditization path that we're on, this is inevitable. It is happening. We all just need to lean in on it. Um, and, and so, yeah, the, the, the bottom one could be your, you know, your corporate tools. But for us, that extended all the way up into running data centers, too. I didn't need to run 13 data centers. In fact, if we wanted to reinvent our business and build this big data platform and reinvent forecasting, which we'll talk about, there was no way that I was going to be able to forget the money. Even with an unlimited sum of money, I wouldn't have the, the technical talent to be able to scale that quickly to run the old, build the new, and then deal with both simultaneously. And so we had to recognize that almost everything we were doing was a commodity at that time. And we had to face up to that. And that's a hard thing. That's a really hard thing as IT professionals, when you recognize, wow, I've been doing this for 10 years and I'm the world's best at whatever, and now I'm not because I need to go learn this new thing and I kind of almost feel like I'm starting over. The reality is you're not starting over. You know, what, 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 what I have found is you carry everything you've done in your career along with you and they all build. And just because you're not doing what you started doing five years ago and you're doing something new today, you're, you're that much more productive and that much more valuable on the team. And so this journey that we were on around commoditization um, really, really forced us to change the engineering principles that we had within the team. Um, making sure that everything we did was aligned with the business. So we, were, we, we, we wanted to make sure we were never doing a science project. We didn't want to be off in a, in, a, in a lab somewhere just creating something because we thought, well, poof, this is cool. And then everybody looks at it and says, well, that is cool, but I don't know what to do with that and I can't commercialize that. So we had to be very financially disciplined as a team because we really wanted to go and do some big things and we wanted to reinvent the company. And so every dollar that I could scrape together to invest in the new was really important. So we had to make sure that every single person, whether you were stacking a router, answering a support line, you know, fixing a database, writing code, or managing people, I needed everybody to really know where we were going as a business. Um, and so we mass transparency around the shift that we needed to go through. We had our burning platform as a business. You saw my burning platform from a technology standpoint, but we had a business burning platform too, which was the fact that TV wasn't necessarily a growth engine anymore. TV was going through its own decline, and it is today. In general, not just the Weather Channel, but in general, people are watching less TV, subscribing to TV services less. We had to burn that ship and move and focus on the future. And when we did that, that really meant that we had to create an organizational culture to bring all of our disparate teams together to make sure that we didn't have any sort of organizational challenges or kind of rubs going on that were going to slow us down from the speed that we needed to. You can get stuff done when you have a lot of different groups, but as you probably know from your own you know, personal experiences, it just takes a little bit more time. So we spent a lot of time making sure we got the organizational structure right. Um, and then we needed to make sure that our technical roadmap was right. So how do we make sure that we are radically simplifying everything we do, avoiding vendor lock-in? Really key component for us was to make sure that we stayed vendor agnostic. And we'll talk about that and how does that carry through the implementation. But we wanted to make sure that we were not beholden to any individual vendor in the new design. And we wanted to make sure that we got away from kind of the old school thinking of SLAs and disaster recovery and, you know, my pager went off and I got to get on a bridge call. How do we make the entire environment more resilient? After all, we wanted to become the data platform to give the entire world not just their weather forecast, but their weather warnings, their alerts, 
safety information that absolutely saves lives every day. We took this very seriously. So there was a lot of work around kind of the engineering principles. Um, oops. I think I uh, went, oh wait, no I didn't. Um, so when you think about what we had to do to build out these capabilities, and you think about weather, for us, let me get the slide right, there we go. We knew that IoT data, data at its core, was really the future for us. So if, if our core resource was the weather forecast, and it was all about creating a more accurate weather forecast, because with an improved accuracy in the forecast and improved precision, I could then do a lot more with it. And so for us, it was all around, wait a minute, all this new sensor data is coming in. We need to realize that we're not building a weather platform. We're building a data platform. And that's an agnostic data platform because we're going to get data from all over the place. Because I don't know what the next device is that's going to be cool. And I don't know what I need to collect it from next. And so whether I'm collecting data from an, a, an airplane, so we collect data from aircraft today. We power about 55,000 flights every day. There are flight plans, fuel load calculations. We do in-flight turbulence monitoring. That plane's accelerometer send us data in real time. We process that. And we'll manipulate and send back new and altered flight plans so that the aircraft can go around and find the smoothest air possible. So gone are the days where the pilot's having to radio down and talk to his buddies or call down and talk to a controller. You know, she can now just see on the panel of the plane that, oh, wait a minute, I have a new flight path. We're going to actually modify now. So that's all now computerized. And that's dramatically cut down the amount of uh, wear and tear on aircraft, as well as injuries to flight crew and passengers, because we're now using sharing across the different airlines. And we're sharing data. And we're actually kind of crowdsourcing turbulence data off of planes to improve that experience flows through almost any device you can think of. So that, that smartphone in your pocket has a pressure sensor on it in many cases. And in many cases, if you've got our app installed, and I would, would guess probably 80 to 85% of you here today have our app installed, thank you for sending us pressure data. We appreciate that. That helps us. Um, that gives us about 40 million barometric pressure reports from smartphones every single day from around the world. And if you, if you look at weather forecasting, all of this data starts to become valuable. Whether it's the plane up in the sky or the cell phone in your pocket, all of this can come together and help us have a better understanding of the current state of the Earth's atmosphere. Because we're not perfect. You know, I know you've got your umbrellas, and you know, we're not perfect on the weather forecast, and I apologize for that. You can you know, throw stuff at me. Um, on a three-day basis, we're about 76 to 78% accurate, um, which isn't bad. Um, but you know, we're always striving to do better. We're happy that we're the world's number one most accurate weather forecaster. We get graded by a third party every month. But usually when we get it wrong, it's because we don't have the right understanding of the current state of the Earth. We're usually starting with the wrong starting point. And then the mathematical models uh, you know, obviously end up incorrect because we started with the wrong data to begin with. And so a lot of focus in why IoT data and all the machine-to-machine -machine data and all these sensors that are lighting up around us every day are so important is because having 530 million personal weather station reports that come into us every day, that's, that wouldn't have been possible. There are 200,000 personal weather stations that are just out there that consumers buy, and they have them, and they report data to us. And that's incredibly helpful. In the United States, we have about 100,000 of the 200,000 here in the US. It's a big number. The National Weather Service has about 1,300 reporting stations in the US. So if you think about the difference in granularity from what the National Weather Service has to what we have, it's tremendous. If you look at the Bay Area, the Bay Area, if you go through the Department of Defense, the FAA, and the National Weather Service, there are 14 true observation stations. Not bad. You get a good understanding of what's going on. But if you've spent any time in the Bay Area, you understand that there's a lot of microclimate situations going on in the Bay Area. You can literally go like three miles 
and you can go from 50 degrees to 80 degrees. I mean, it really is crazy. But if you, if you have personal weather stations and you look at the full array of our data capabilities, 96 in the same area if we now include all that we can get from our crowdsourced environment. 96 gives us a much richer insight down at a localized level to understand what's going on. That really helps us create a much better forecast. And we knew that we had to continue to advance this because gone are the days where you look in the newspaper and try to find your weather forecast, right? We knew we had to get more specific. We knew that we had to make the weather forecast better. So today, we aggregate 170 different weather models on a continuous basis to create a forecast for 2.2 billion locations, and we update that every 15 minutes. It seems a little impressive, but let me tell you what we were doing four years ago. Four years ago, we were creating a forecast every six hours for 2.2 million locations. And so being able to now bring in all of these additional models and go from six hours to 15 minutes and go from 2.2 million locations to 2.2 billion, really important, really important. In the past, those black dots on the left, those are the observation stations. That is where we would have created a forecast. That's part of the 2.2 million, if you looked across the globe, 2.2 million locations. So that's what you would get. And then if you needed information for a city, we would just extrapolate the data. We would look at an elevation change. We would look at how far are you from a, a true forecast point, And we would map it. And that's still today what a lot of forecasting companies do. But we looked at that and said, that's not good enough. Because now everybody's got a smartphone in their pocket. And they want a forecast for right here, right now, where I am. Not a forecast for down the road. Not a forecast for the nearest airport. I don't want a forecast for Boston Logan. I want a forecast for Cambridge. And I don't want an extrapolated one. I want a real one. So on the right, that's what we have today. So if you look at those dots, we are creating a forecast for every four kilometer grid point on the entire surface of the Earth. And we update that every 15 minutes. A fundamental change in how weather forecasting was done all over the last few years. So again, you start talking to the team around, wait a minute, this is the change we want to go through. This is what we want to, oops, sorry. This is what we want to build. This is what we need to build. This is the kind of capability we need to have to be successful and growing in a thriving organization in the future. So we knew we needed to completely start over and build a data platform that could handle this. So we had to throw away the original architecture diagram. We had to completely start over with a new path forward. And so, what we built was a completely open source based uh, with our own proprietary software in it as well, but mostly open source based data platform that today ingests about 100 terabytes of data every day from 800 different sources. And on the distribution side, we handle around 345,000 queries a second. Um, and so when you look at the size and scale of that and the different types of data that come in, we have 26 odd different types of data, gridded data, key value data, time series data. We have, we have um, kind of binary data. We have streams of data. When a radar dish sweeps, it actually se sends a binary stream. We have to create, you know, capture those packets, store them, and then rasterize that and turn it into a gr the picture you see on a, on a radar screen. We didn't want to build one of these for every different type of data. We knew that we needed to actually move ourselves completely into the world where we saw all data the same and recognize that we were going to just be getting into being a big data business. And that was fundamentally what we had to build. And so taking a team and recognizing that, yes, we're going to build this. It's going to run completely in the cloud. There's no origin infrastructure for it. We're going to run it in US on the East Coast, US in the West Coast. We're going to run it in Europe. We're going to run it in Asia. We're going to run it hot all of the time. We're always going to be in disaster recovery mode. There is no more failover. There is no more thinking like that. We're running truly a cloud-based data platform. Massive mind shift change that, that the entire team had to go through to think differently around how do we build that? How do we test for that?
How do we monitor that? How do we do deployments for that? The entire, every single piece of our puzzle had to change. The, the entire culture of the team had to shift and every tool that we used had to change. How we thought about that had to change and, and we needed to embrace it and have fun with it. I mean, we only live once, so you better get up every day and love what you do. And so it was really important that the team really saw this, building this, and competing with the likes of Facebook and Google, who kind of run at the scale that we're talking about. We wanted to do that, but we wanted to rely on public cloud infrastructure, not build our own. And so it was a fun challenge. A lot of people got very excited about doing that. And so from, from my standpoint, the kind of culture that I needed to have was about being live. And so I like music. I like live music. I like going to concerts. I would rather go to a concert than just listen to pre-recorded music. I think it's more fun to be at a concert. So when I think about an IT team, I think for the last couple of decades, IT software vendors, IT leadership, just IT industry in general, has tried to figure out how to make IT be pre-recorded. How do we take what we do and put it in a run book? And how do we make it repeatable and make sure we do the same thing every time, all the time? And every time you hit play, I get the same thing. But as you spend enough time in IT, you realize you never get the same. The problem is never exactly the same thing twice. There's always a slight nuance, a slight difference. Just as if you're up on stage, the drummer might drop his stick, the guitarist might drop his pick, there might be feedback from the, the system, right? Things happen and you have to adjust. And good bands, I'm a big fan of Rush, good bands who play together for a long time instinctively know how to carry on and pick up for somebody if there was a problem within the, you know, in their case, the three band, three man band um, and their team. Three people on the team, anything can happen, they always pick up for one another, the show goes on. So how do you turn IT into that same thing where we are comfortable going out on stage together? We're going to make mistakes. That's inevitable, just as they do. But we pick up for one another, and we learn to trust each other, and we actually then look at IT as more of a live performance than something that we're trying to do in this pre-recorded way where we hide you know, and try to kind of fall back to procedures. It's a big shift, because none of us in, is, you know, at least my perspective and my history has told, you know, that's not what we were told to do. We were taught how to run, write run books and how to, you know, get the process down. But I think moving to a live situation creates a more flexible, scalable team. And if you think about all of the change going on around us, big companies, Ford, GE, they're transforming themselves. GE doesn't want to talk about making locomotives anymore. They want to talk about being a software company. Ford doesn't want to talk about being in the automobile manufacturing business. They want to talk about being a software company. If you're building the same thing over and over and over again, it's probably OK to create a pre-recorded you know, you know, environment where you've got robots making it. But in the software world, where we're changing every day, we do six releases a day to weather.com. It's the 15th most used website on the planet. I, I can't create a run book for six releases a day. It would take me a whole day just to update the run book from the release in the morning. So we have to think differently. We had to really rethink how we were going to work as a team. And as we all know, usually what gets measured gets managed, and what gets managed gets done. So the first step was really to how, do we, how are we monitoring and how are we looking at, or how are we successful? Are we up, are we down? Kind of in the old way of IT, you'd have a bunch of uh, you know, green light, red lights, firewalls up, networks up, databases up, everything's up, everything's good, my stuff's good, I'm going home, everything's great. But then you actually look at the end user experience and half the world can't you know, do whatever it is they're trying to do. I don't know whose fault it is, my stuff's good. So helping the team understand that at, at the end of the day, the only thing I cared about moving forward was the end user experience. Can everybody achieve what they are trying to do? If everything is green and somebody can't achieve it, then we 
as a band have failed. We have not entertained the audience. And so we need to think and work together. And so changing the goals of the entire team to say, wait a minute, no, we're all now codependent. The only thing you all together are going to be graded on, bonused on, incented on, rewarded for, is the absolute uptime of the end result of whatever it is that we're trying to do. And so that was a big cultural shift. Because now all of a sudden I got my network team going, well, I don't want to be responsible for the database team. Like, they're a bunch of yahoos. And you got to work through that. We had to work through that and go, no, 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 no. They're not yahoos. Let's, let's bring them to the table. Let's go, through, let's go through and realize that, you know, yes, the network team probably is a little bit bitter because it's always the network's fault. Right? Am I right? So it's always the network's fault. So if we all agree on that, no, that's not what we said. So it was really important that we all got on the same page around how we were working together as a team, which started with how we were going to measure success. So I think that was a really big shift for us. The other thing we had to do is shift how we looked at pricing ourselves. We were constantly in this position where our traffic and our growth was at a 45 degree you know, in, incline, which was great. So our costs were at a 45 degree incline. But yet, that's not how budgeting worked, at least not in our organization. The budget was flat. And so what did you do? You would go find other things you could cut, cut other services, band-aid something. And that's how IT debt gets created time and time again. We keep doing it to ourselves. We've been doing it to ourselves for 25, 30 years, where we create technical debt over and over again. And a lot of it's driven by the budgeting process. And so we had to shift in our world to a unit cost perspective. Because I can control my unit costs the cost per whatever, the cost per API call, the cost per page view, I can control that. That's in my control. I'll sign up for a 20% year-on-year decrease of the cost per call on the API. No problem. I have no idea what we're going to do on the business side, the consumption side, to go and sell that. So if, if the number of calls goes up, that I, I can't be held accountable for that. But luckily, if we're doing that, then revenue should be going up. So why don't we align the IT budget around our, our unit costs? And that way, I can be a little bit more flexible. And let's float with the revenue situation. And if the revenue is declining, our, our, our volume will decline. And therefore, we won't cost as much. I'm fine with that. If our revenue is you know, going up and increasing, that's OK, because our volume will go up. And that's OK, because our budget will go up. And so we had, this was a big shift. And this was, went all the way to the board of the company. We spent a lot of time as a, as a, as a company rethinking, wait a minute, we do, this does make sense. We need to get out of this trap that IT always finds itself, where we're in this fixed budget mode, regardless of the demands on us. And so I know not everybody is in, in here is empowered to go and change their budget. But as a, as a group, if we all start thinking this way, and we all start trying to figure out, well, how would I create the unit cost for what it is I do? Like, that's a big step. Just even figuring that out, what does it cost for me to run email for a person for a year? What does it cost for me to provide X service, X capability for, you know, per whatever? Like, all of these things take time to figure out, but I think it starts with understanding around you know, what gets measured. So one of the things I talked about was the fact that we kind of had our burning ship moment. TV was declining. We knew we had to shift and become a big data technology business. We knew we wanted to make sure we could power airlines, insurance companies, energy trading companies, energy manufacturing businesses. We wanted to make sure that we could provide weather-triggered advertising. There was a lot of businesses we wanted to go into. We knew we had to create that data platform. So the reason why I love the SR71 and the story behind the SR71 was because when the U-2 was shot down during the Cold War, that was our spy plane. That was the United States' way of getting information around what was going on in the Soviet Union. 
satellites weren't really there yet. And so the th all of a sudden, this plane we thought was you know, completely safe from surface-to-air missiles gets shot down, and we had nothing. We were now vulnerable overnight. Big shock to our system. And so the SR-71 team was basically challenged to go create a plane that, that was invincible, and they needed to do it in like, you know, a year. It took them a little bit longer than that, but I mean, there was a mad rush. And so they had to create an entirely new aircraft. They, they, they created and invented titanium for this project. Massive. They had to create new tools. You can't, you know, drill titanium with a steel drill bit. Right? That titanium was so fragile when it was first developed that if you dropped it on the floor, it would shatter. It was absolutely crazy that they had to start with every single piece down to the drill bit to put the rivet hole and start over. Every tool, everything had to be rethought, the metal, the engineering, all of it. So there were a lot of design flaws that came from the speed at which that team had to operate. You can see on the picture there flying, the, the, um, the, uh, the liquid pouring out of the wings and the liquid here leaking out. The aircraft leaked fuel. Right? So when it flew, it would expand somewhere between two to six inches in length because of the heat generated when it flew. And so when it sat on the tarmac, it would literally sit there and leak fuel. And immediately after takeoff, they would have to refuel it because it, it literally leaked so much fuel sitting there before it took off that it was, on, it was basically three quarters empty by the time it got up in the air. Can you imagine today designing an aircraft where it was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Hey, yeah, it leaks a little fuel. It'll be fine. <laughs> no, who works like that? But if you think about how we sometimes have worked in IT, we get so worried about the fact that something's leaking fuel that we'll say, well, we're not ready yet. But they didn't have that option. We, we had to get the plane in the air. So it was OK that it leaked fuel. It's fine. We'll just refuel it in the air. What's the problem? Got a solution. So I have a sign that hangs on my door that says, safe is risky. And I think it's really important that in IT we recognize the transformation that is going on around us. When you have entire in companies and the Fortune 100, the Fortune 50, that are trying to go from being a manufacturing company to being a software company, these are massive shifts, massive shifts. And they're not about playing it safe. These are risky, risky bets. And they're betting on us. They're betting on each of you. They're betting on the IT world. They're betting on technology professionals, software developers, hardware engineers, support folks. All of us have to come together as a band to make this work. And so I encourage you to think about your role building this aircraft, realizing that you have to get the job done, taking calculated risks. We have to become more comfortable as an IT industry, if we're going to continue the pace of innovation that we're seeing, we have to continue to find ways to be comfortable commoditizing what we currently do, reinventing ourselves every day to think about what we need to do in the future, and allowing ourselves to build some planes that leak a little fuel on the ground. It's, it's OK. It worked. The reason I know it worked is because today the SR-71 still holds the land speed record from New York to London, London to Los Angeles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And at, at cruise, like I said, it would grow sometimes four, sometimes six inches because the aircraft would heat up to 600 degrees. It could photograph an entire swath of North Korea in seven minutes. It's just mind-boggling. The best fact, and this is what I love, and this is what I think makes it all come back to IT, is the engine, the, the, the run, I think it was from, uh, Los, from London to Los Angeles. They took off from London, and one of the engines failed. And the, and the pilot was like, well, we're already up in the air. Let's just go for it. And so they flew the whole run on one engine, and still to this day, it's it holds the land speed record for that run. 
and they did it on one engine. So a lot of times we spend time building in, you know, redundancy. Their DR strategy worked, but they didn't stop everything they were doing. They kept going. They pushed through it, and they, they still exited the gate, the timing gate, at Mach 3.2 on one engine. And so uh, over the course of that plane's service, over 1,000 surface-to-air air missiles were fired at it, and it was never shot down. It was never hit. That team came together. They built entirely new materials, new tools to build those materials, new ways of working, launched the thing leaking fuel, and it's still one of the most amazing aircraft that I've ever flown. And I think if each of us think about our role in IT and our role as technology professionals in the same way that they, the, the Skunk Works team, thought about building the SR-71, the amount that we could achieve over the next five to 10 years is going to boggle our minds, boggle our minds. And so as you go th forward and you think about what can I do to help, all of us can, can recognize that we're in this together. We are a band. We have to act and work and think together and just have courage. All of this comes down to having courage. The transformation that we went through, the willingness to say, well, we are going to punt completely into public cloud. We are going for it. We're rebuilding everything. That was, at the end of the day, just a gutsy call that we were willing to take. Safe was risky. So each of you has the opportunity to change what gets measured in your department or in your role. What are you going to measure for yourself? You can change what gets measured. Wherever you can find a barrier or a layer, figure out how to remove it. Make sure you've got single person accountability. This gets really, really important when you have large, complex organizations. You walk into a meeting, do you really know who's in charge of making the call? Because if you don't know who's making the call, why are you having the meeting? Push yourselves on that as an organization. You don't have to wait for some memo. I mean, Ann will probably send a memo if you want her to, but like, push yourselves. Like, do you guys, are you, are you aligned around what's going to happen? Play to your strengths, supplement your weaknesses. It's okay, we're not all always the expert. It's okay where we are weak. Let's talk about it and let's go figure out how we supplement it. Have the courage to decide. And in my case, I viewed my role mostly as being the chief disorganizer. Anytime I feel like something is starting to get kind of well-oiled, it's time to blow it up because then we're not moving fast enough. So that's the journey we've been on. Uh, I'm not sure how much time we have left, but thank you for your attention. Hopefully that was entertaining. And uh, happy to take questions if, uh, if we have time. Okay. So we have a time for a few questions if anybody wants to yell one out. Yes. So uh, the question is, is, is our data available? So um, we have about, on an average month, 20 to 25,000 unique individual developers active on the APIs every month. Um, and uh, I, I can circulate out, uh, but if you go to, you know, weather.com, um, I think it's, I think it's weather.com slash data feeds off the top of my head, uh, you can sign up and gain access right now. Um, you can also just uh, shoot me an email. I'm not sure if I have my last slide that has my, uh, no, but um, just reach out to me. We'll, we can, you can find me. Um, and I can help you get access to it. We, we, we absolutely are happy to have people play with the data. Um, we've got uh, very rich data on uh, current uh, weather as well as forecasted weather. Um, and we're very close in the matter of weeks to be uh, starting to begin to launch a very rich, we've got one today, but it's not as great as we would like around the historical uh, weather information. Yes. We are an agile shop, absolutely. Um, the teams are all self-contained, um, so everything from development to QA to project management to DevOps. Every unit, every component, and every module of the system or the website or the mobile development team or the forecasting team, 
There's a lot of groups, obviously, that come together to make this happen. Um, they are all responsible end-to-end -end for their own delivery. We do have an overlay around kind of operations and monitoring, um, but they're not there to actually fix anything. They're there to make sure that somebody's minding the store and, and to ensure that the folks that can fix it are, are working on it and that we're communicating appropriately. Um, but we, we run sprints just like everybody else does, and um, some sprints are super fast. You know, if you're working on weather.com or weather underground, it can work very quickly. Um, if you're, you know, working on our aviation tooling, um, those sprints might be, you know, four months uh, just because of the certification processes that go, you know, along with getting things through, you know, an FAA certification process. So they vary, but yes, we are. Yes. Well, that was loud. Yes. Yeah, so um, what the, the worst case in, so the question was, you know, talk about the, the new platform and what we do with the old platform in that transitionary period. The worst, you know, in state we could end up with was some hybrid model where we had the old and the new. Because, like, you know, we've all seen that movie, right? Um, many of us have starred in that movie, myself included. And so I uh, didn't want to do that again. Um, so we just had to be very, very, very focused on decommissioning. We celebrate decommissioning, you know, uh, with almost as much gusto and fun as we celebrate something launching. Um, and so we created a culture where decommissioning was cool. We would actually decommission stuff, take it apart, and create plaques and trophies for people based upon the parts of the system. Um, we would hang those up on the wall and, you know, take them out and... We are in Atlanta, so we shot at them. Um, you know, <laughs> we did all kinds of fun stuff to make it fun and cool to kill old tech. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I think it, was, it really became culturally exciting to de to, to, for teams to kind of win the charge of decommissioning. And so, um, you know, basically we put the old system into as much of a maintenance mode as we could. We couldn't go dark. Uh, because we were still running and operating a business and we still had to deliver new capabilities while we were building the new. Um, the new system launched um, um, with, um, with the iPhone um, 5 um, because we were the default weather provider uh, on, on that uh, operating system and that release globally. And so when that phone hit the market, we were live. Um, and then from that point forward, the clock started ticking on getting everything moved over. Um, out of the several thousand old connection points, I think we are down to nine, um, and they will all be done, and that system will be shot by the end of June, so the end of this month. Um, so we've been just maniacally focused on it, and you just can't ever let up. I mean, that's, that was pretty much the main you know, takeaway. About a year. So the question was, how much time did it take for the team to develop the skills? It was a, a, a really a year journey. Um, you know, you could look at it in tranches, um, and there were, to be honest, there were uh, a, a fair number of folks who said, well, "That's not for me. I don't want to do this. I actually want to just, uh, uh, you know, I'm an Oracle, you know, SQL DBA, and that's what I want to do. And I don't see Oracle SQL in your uh, roadmap because it's not." Um, and if you really want to run a rack system, I mean, heaven help you, but if you really want to run a rack system, like, go. Like, that, I, I will help you find a job. I want you to be happy, and I would encourage that, and we would just be very open about it. It wasn't something that we would hide from, um, but we're not going to do that, um, and, uh, and that's okay. Um, but uh, it took about a year, I would say, for the team, and it wasn't necessarily all about the technology, skills, it was the cultural shift, and just, we had to unlearn a lot of bad behaviors. You know, it was that reaction to do the wrong thing, because, you know, for a long time, we were trained to do the wrong thing. One last question. Come on up. What's the difference since the acquisition? <laughs> uh, what time does the bar open? Um, <laughs> <laughs> as soon as I'm done, I'm standing in between you and the bar. Um, 
uh, being a part of IBM is an amazing journey when you go from being a 1,400 person company to a 400,000 person company. Um, you could probably just respect that there's nothing that's the same. Um, the good news is, is IBM has been awesome. They have been so respectful of what we've built, of the culture we've had, and they've said, we don't want to break it. Do not let us break you. Um, help us take what you guys have built, both from a technical perspective and a team perspective, and infuse that into IBM. So in, there are a lot of cases where there's almost a reverse integration going on, which has been highly exciting. So. All right, thank you all very much.